So today we're going to talk about the psychology of color, how it affects our everyday lives, um, but more importantly, how it affects um, your psychological engagement with the world. Uh, but the first thing that we're going to do is kind of think about what color actually is um, according to a, a more psychological background. So color is a visual experience that subconsciously affects an individual's functions and emotions. We have a lot of research into this. Uh, the human response to color is based upon one's perception of behavioral aspects that are controlled by the brain. So the study of color is a very complex subject composed of a lot of theories, and many experiments have been conducted to prove that color is indeed an influential factor composed of both subjective and objective aspects. So color affects individuals differently based on their gender, their age, their culture. Another word for that would be um, demographic and biological factors uh, that we'll kind of talk about today. So through history, ancient scholars used color to solve mysteries among their time. Uh, sometimes portrayed as symbolic or magical, color has been used in healing practices as far back as the Egyptian period. However, interest in color decreased throughout the Middle Ages with the advancement of scientific knowledge. Um, it wasn't until the late 19th century that color would begin to be practiced in healing again. Um, so by considering color in design, it allows designers to create a mood within a space that tells a story and leaves an emotional impact on each individual. So light intensity, surface reflection, and surrounding objects do play a factor in how color is actually perceived. So the interior space affects the perception of color directly through artificial lighting. And, quote, um, according to scientific research, the color re rending index, or CRI, was developed to describe how well colors are rendered by artificial light sources compared with natural light. And color is perceived based upon the context of the space and should be considered when developing a color scheme. So there are two forms of... Um, it impacts on you and your body and your mind. Uh, the first one is psychological, and the second one is physiological. And the easy way to remember that is that psychological obviously refers to your consciousness, your subconsciousness, and your unconscious. Um, psycholog physiological, sorry, physiological refers to the effects the stimuli have upon us, meaning upon your body. For instance, the color red makes people hungry. The color pink soothes people physically lowers the heart rate. Um, there's a neuropsychological aspect to color as well. And what I've gotten here is I've gotten a breakdown of the brain itself and what these various um, elements of the brain actually do. For instance, the thalamus is associated with the senses, sight, hearing, taste, and touch, right? So all of these things, the cerebellum, the pituitary gland, the reticular formation, um, how the eye is connected to the brain, the cerebrum, all of these things are connected together in order to cause pleasure or displeasure in the engagement and interaction with color. There's a thing called chromotherapy, and it's a kind of mystic, um, new age approach to color in that it's presumed that color can have healing effects on your um, subconscious, essentially. Um, in this case, the, it might be referred to as uh, the chakras. Um, so there's a nice little quote here. Colors, like features, follow the changes of emotions from Pablo Picasso. Um, and the energies of the body are separated into seven main chakras. Um, and each energy stems from a major nerve ganglia, uh, so an actual part in the body, the anatomy of the body, um, and all connect to the spinal column. So a lot of this deals with um, meditation um, and really all, all kinds of um, impactful sensory responses to color. For instance, uh, green is the color of the heart chakra, also known as the anahata. And this chakra is located at the center of the chest area and is linked to the entire area of the heart, the lungs, the circulatory system, and the cardiac plexus, for those who, who believe in this. Um, it's also believed that um, there are some environmental influences to the way we experience color psychologically as well. Um, so let's look at the building blocks of it. The first one is the biological reactions to a color stimulus. Um, that, that's your, bodily, body, your body's reaction to color. Um, then there's the collective unconscious. That, so that's our social unconsciousness. 
right? So uh, what we all collectively believe together in our unconscious. And then there's conscious symbolism or associations, and that's pretty much common associations with how we perceive color. Um, then there's cultural influences and mannerisms. So of course, like white in the West is generally associated with purity. It's often worn to weddings because of the virginal association with it, but white is associated with death in the East. Nothingness. Then we have the influence of trends and fashions and styles. So those things do creep into your relationship with color psychologically. And then of course your personal relationship to them. If someone, um, if a blue car hit you at a high speed and ruined your life, um, you might have an association with blue, personally. So let's start with red. Um, it's the most physical color in the spectrum. It's associated with the heart and blood. And the color has always proven to raise the heart rate and energy level. Um, usually if it's used in interiors, red is used to make a bold statement. Um, it's often used in restaurants in order to increase appetite. Um, or logos associated with... Um, the food. So in residential design, the red wall might create a warm, cozy feeling that makes you want to sit around. So let's move to orange. Orange is generally known to encourage activity and stimulate conversation. Subjectivity, the vibrant color, is either greatly liked or disliked. And around 500 BC, the fruit inspired the name of the color orange, uh, which was known as the fruit of gods and kings. Often it's associated with the term rebirth, and it's gained a, regained a popularity in Renaissance paintings and was an iconic color of 90s fashion trend, also in the 70s as well. And then, of course, yellow. It's uh, directly related to, um, to the sun, obviously, because it's the thing that brings us all energy and life. And it's also the easiest color to actually see. Um, so different shades of yellow convey different messages. And it generally brings a kind of warmth and softness to a space. Green is, of course, the color of nature. You're going to associate with um, prosperity, essentially, um, fecundity, health, um, the forest. Um, it generally has a mood that is essentially about awareness, environmental awareness and fertility, right? So blue, uh, it's obviously the color of water and sky. Um, it generally calms. Um, it calms physiologically and psychologically. But blue is also associated with many religious practices, meaning mercy and honor. So since blue is a symbol of rest, it's often found in healthcare design and in residential uh, spaces, especially in bedrooms. The color purple um, is, has essentially uh, an uplifting effect. Um, it's not a calming color, so it encourages creativity, and it's often symbolic to royalty. Um, and as we talked about last week, uh, the tiny little um, sea um, snails were used in order to create uh, early ancient versions of violet, which is why it was so expensive. And then we have neutrals, white, black, gray, or even natural grays. So as a white flag indicates truce, the color white also is a symbol of peace. It's also the presence of light and the best way to represent cleanliness. So snow and clouds also have these properties, which obviously have a great emotional effect of clarity and purification. And then black is a color that creates depth within spaces. Um, it has a very big authority to it and oftentimes leaves you with a feeling of emptiness. So color harmonies play a giant role. So how these colors are actually combined play a role in how your viewer is going to engage psychologically with your color. Um, so... Of an example of that would be, you know, an analogous color scheme is going to be very sort of easy to look at and that all of these colors are close to each other on the color wheel. And in that, there's a certain level of ease. Um, and polychroma is going to really uplift because ultimately these are very vibrant colors that are going to be associated with uh, energy. So. We have lots of artists who, uh, artists and designers who ultimately have influenced how we perceive color and understand it today. Uh, the first of which, and probably the most important to color theory, is Joseph Albers. And we talked about him at length when we talked about his theory of color interactions. And he wrote many books on this. He taught at Yale. And he was a member of the Bauhaus, if you remember. Um, so he said, color is understood through experience. Known for his color context studies that explore the interaction of color, um, he 
primarily was a painter, and, uh, you know, his paintings go for a lot of money. Um, but he also, uh, you know, did stained glass, and uh, he really linked architecture and painting. So how colors are perceived is dependent on what colors are around it, was essentially the theory that he developed on his own. Then we have uh, Faber Biren, and he said that the study of color is essentially a mental and psychological experience for the term color itself refers to sensation. So he's referred to as the father of applied color psychology. Um, so he really is the kind of person to look to in terms of theories about how we interact with color um, intellectually, psychologically, emotionally. He discovered the relationship of the fundamental attributes pertaining to hues, shades, tints, and tone, which, of course, we studied earlier in the semester. Then we have a guy named Kareem Rashid. You actually may have seen him around. He's a very, very famous designer, very highly sought after today. He says, I use extensive variations of color to create form, depth, mood, feeling, texture, and to touch our everyday public memory. Color is not just surface, and it's not intangible. It's very real, very strong. It's a powerful tool and has real physical presence. So he's known as a, to be an industrial designer and an interior architect, and we'll show a couple of his works uh, later on. So, color in space. Um, for example, the very, very famous home designed by Frank Lloyd Wright um, called Falling Water, which literally straddles a, um, a waterfall. So integrated over a waterfall, this residence, it's a private residence, is famous for incorporating nature and architecture into man-made structure with horizontal lines and cantilevers. Cantilevers are like basically roofs that jut out that look like they have absolutely no support. So it, it looks a bit like um, uh, magical, uh, uh, almost like it couldn't fit within physics. So falling water, he said, was meant to evolve and change over time, reflecting those who occupied the retreat. Um, it really was about planning and programming um, and how the viewers utilize the space itself. So he used neutral colors mostly. Um, he said that mastery of color can easily consume a lifetime of study, observation, experimentation, reflection, study, research, and practice work together to develop expertise in color. Um, he did this for a family known as the Kaufmans. Um, and he really, the Kaufman, Edgar Kaufman, really did in, in contribute to the um, design of the space. He used Cherokee Red, um, which is associated with brick. And it was Wright's favorite color. He used ochre and lots of ochres, so lots of browns and yellows and black walnut. So wood to contrast the, the very vibrant color palette that he was pulling from. Then we have, um, I believe this is designed by Kareem Rashid, the Phoenix Children's Hospital. No, sorry, it's the HKS Architects. And they renovated it in order to create this sort of space age uplifting um, design plan that really allowed for the natural light to uh, move color in an interesting way. And so here we have the, the floor plans of what those spaces actually look like. And just a reminder here, this is a children's hospital, so there is intention behind the color usage. Then we have the Switch Restaurant and Lounge by Kareem Rashid. Very hip, very trendy, very vibrant, but also very moody. And the Olafur Eliasson, who's an artist and an architect, he designed this place called the Rainbow Panorama. It's a space without boundaries, he says. He wanted to create a dialogue between existing architecture and the city of our house uh, in Denmark in order to really sort of push the inside outside. So how does color impact us as designers and artists? It can give the direction and defines circulation of the room itself. It can create a mood and it can tell a story. It can affect, affect things like taste and smell. Synesthesia is a term that you might not be familiar with. It basically says that we have a sensory response that is outside of the visual to color sometimes. Sometimes we smell colors. Um, and there are select individuals who have this phenomenon. It can also create a connection between the surrounding environment and the interior space itself. So I've got some contemporary artists who utilize color in an interesting way, Jeff Koons being a contemporary painter. 
Um, Banksy, of course, who uses color very effectively and very minimally. And uh, uh, one of my favorite painters, Michael Reeder, who uses color as a means to sort of challenge the uplifting content of the work, or challenge the uplifting um, expectation associated with the colors, because the content of the work is oftentimes quite dark. Versus Jenny Seville, who's a painter of figures, oftentimes very morose, very um, gloomy images, um, very jarring images that create a kind of um, uh, disturbing reflection. And then the last artist I'll talk about is Devin Shimoyama. He's one of my favorites. He does um, portraits and utilizes color in a really effective way um, in that they're sort of strange and they're out, you know, kind of out of this world. Um, and the expectation is, is that these are sort of somewhat psychedelic. So that is a lecture on color psychology.